spirits began to drop. <laughs> the chief, when he swore us in, he said, now your ass belongs to Uncle Sam. <laughs> <laughs> and when we got to Norfolk, Virginia, the Marines, they, they were ordering us around like you were slaves, you know. Yeah. And that night, when I got into my hammock, we didn't give us bunks, we had hammocks. Yeah, hammocks. I, I said to the, in my prayers, I said, Dear Lord, what have I gotten myself into? <laughs> if I could have quit right then, I would have, you know. Yeah. But things got better as every days went on. Uh -huh. We learned to fold our clothes and how to wash our clothes. Uh -huh. And we got some, we started our training with World War I rifles. Uh -huh. And we trained for 14 weeks. We didn't have enough men to start a platoon. We needed 72, I think. How many did you have? Well, we had about 60-something. 60 60-something. 60 and uh, I think it took eight eight men to a squad, so uh, maybe nine, eight or nine squads we needed to start. So we, we started two weeks late. Uh, we trained every day from about 8, 8.30 until 3.30 in the afternoon. And then we had to go back and wash our clothes and hang them on the line with, yeah. with strings. <laughs> certain way, everything had to be done a certain way. Very, very particular with the Navy. Now real quick for the record, could you just tell me what your rank was in the Navy? Uh -huh. I was a plenty of seaman at that time. Uh-huh, and what was your highest rank? Chief Warrant Officer, Machinist Branch. And real quick, can you tell me where you served? Where? Yeah. Your locations of service? Well, Norfolk, Virginia. Uh huh. And then I was sent to San Pedro, California, uh -huh. where I got the the USS Mississippi. Uh huh. I was assigned a little over three years. And uh, what year did you join the Mississippi again? It was in the, in the spring of 1940. Uh -huh. No. <laughs> no, I made a mistake. Uh, 1936. 1936. Yeah. Yeah. Uh, I got along real well. My division officer, M Division, was a, a warrant, chief warrant officer named John Silva. Uh -huh. He came from Rhode Island. He took a liking to me and he kept pushing me. He would give me good jobs. Instead of cleaning in the buildings, he would give me a, um, a, machine, a machine shop job because he knew I had machine shop training. Uh -huh. And um, I would put um, grooves in valves so the gaskets would hold better. Uh -huh. And uh, before long, I was a machinist made second class. Uh -huh. uh, he gave me 30 days leave so I could go home and brag a little bit. <laughs> what uh, did you do when you were on leave for the 30 days? Well, I just got, went, got along with the family real well. I had a, a sister, Adeline, and she uh, really catered to me. I was her baby, <laughs> baby brother. Yeah. I'm the, I'm the youngest of the family of nine. Uh -huh. uh, I have a picture of the whole family there too. Uh -huh. So, well, I only had uh, twenty some days after getting home and back. I traveled by train, so that took quite a bit of time. Uh -huh. I had a, they gave me a Pullman car, a sleeper in fact. That's when they had sleepers on a train, you could sleep. Uh, I really enjoyed that. I went back to San Pedro, went back to the ship, Mississippi. Uh -huh. We uh, took a, a cruise with the fleet. We got within 50 miles of the equator 
first we first we um, we stopped in um, Hawaii and um, then we took island cruises uh, different different scenes on the island extinct volcano uh-huh. um, he even showed us where you could boil an egg right alongside the road where the steam was coming up okay. from a, from an extinct volcano. Huh. Yeah. Uh, so I think we were on maneuvers twice. On a second maneuver, we we got within 50 miles of the equator. But when you go over the equator, equator, you become a shellback. Yeah. But you go through a a uh, stiff rigmarole in them oh, days. Yeah. It was really uh, mean. Did they take the fire hose out? Oh, they made shillelaghs. Uh, they would make a canvas sack about three foot long and pack it with rags and then soak it in salt water. <laughs> and you went through about 20 men. Everybody had beaten your back, <laughs> your butt. And uh, I'm telling you, my my butt was black and blue for three months. <laughs> In fact, it hit, they beat me so hard it opened a cyst that I had and broke broke the cyst open. So I had to go to Brooklyn Navy uh, Hospital uh-huh. when I got back, and they operated on the cyst. Uh-huh. And I was in the hospital about a month, healing up. And every time they changed the bandage, it took about eight yards of gauze, <laughs> and they. They had that soaked in iodine. They put it into the meat that they had cut out on your tailbone. Uh-huh. Uh, well, anyway. Um, so after after you were off the Mississippi, where did you go? What ship were you on after that? I went on to USS Helena, uh-huh. cruiser light number 50. And she was being finished in Brooklyn Navy Yard. Brooklyn Navy Yard? Yeah. Uh-huh. And for the record, what other ship were you on after the, the Helena sunk? On a cruiser Detroit. Detroit. One of the oldest cruisers in the Navy. Uh-huh. A four-stacker. <laughs> it was used in World War One, in fact. Wow. And where did you sail when you were on, on that? Well, first, we, I met the ship in Seattle, but then we went up into the Aleutians. The Japs had, uh, had captured the Aleut- uh, island of Attu up there. Uh-huh. So we, uh, after our troops got in and chased them up into the mountain, uh, we patrolled the shore so no, no other Japanese ship could get in there. Well, I was there for about three months. At, at two. During them three months, the Japanese made one last ditch stand. They came down from the mountain, the early one, just before it got light. Uh-huh. And they had bayonets on the guns. And they, we had a little hospital there where our, our wounded were being taken care of. They went into that American hospital and died. They bayoneted every one of them poor guys right in their bunks. That's unbelievable. Of course, then our soldiers killed every one of them too, but that was bloody. <coughs> so, moving on, um, just for the record, could you tell me, were you drafted or did you enlist? I enlisted. You enlisted. Yeah. And where were you living at the time? 92 North Main Street, Terryville. Uh-huh. And where did you sign up? Uh, in, New, in New Britain. In New Britain? New Britain, Connecticut. Uh-huh. And why, why, did you, why did you join? Because there were no jobs. Yeah. And the job I did get, <laughs> it, uh, it gave out. Uh-huh. In New London, we were, I'm getting ahead of myself now, but before I joined, I, I worked in Middletown in a asbestos oh, factory, and I worked on 
grinding brake shoes, grinding the edges and so forth. Uh -huh. And on, on clutch facings, they were made of asbestos and rubber. But most of the time I had a, a mask on and a blower would take most of the dust away. So that, uh, that protected me pretty well. Of course, later on I, I had Everything on the ship was asbestos covered also. Uh -huh. And then I'm getting ahead of me myself, but the job I had in Wallace Barnes Company, they had asbestos lines all over, and the boiler itself was covered huh. with an asbestos top. This was so, after. So uh, about 10 years ago, I had my doctor give me an MRI test, to check my lungs, and they were okay. That's good. So I'm lucky I didn't get that asbestos. Now, when he decided to join, why did you pick the uh, the Navy over all the other branches? I guess, huh, I figured I could learn something there. Uh -huh. Then, do you uh, recall your first days in service? My first days? Yeah, after you signed up. Well, I, I had to wait a couple of weeks to get in. I had to pass a quite stiff test. They were only taking high school graduates and college graduates. Uh -huh. In fact, in my platoon, we had a couple of uh, college men. Oh, yeah. yeah. Things were so tough, you couldn't get a job. And Anyway, the asbestos job gave out. <laughs> uh -huh. So I had to do something. That's what forced me into the Navy. And what kind of tests did they perform the first couple of weeks? Before I got in? Yeah. Well, uh, they checked your whole body and give you a physical. Uh -huh. uh, made sure you didn't have flat feet. <laughs> and they gave you a written test. Mm -hmm. It was quite simple for me. Yeah. Yeah. Now, what did it feel like after from being in civilian life to joining the Navy, and now you're in basic training? What, what was it like? That was the toughest part. Yeah. The first, the first couple of weeks in basic training. Uh -huh. huh, I wished I'd never done it, <laughs> but uh, as gradually you start marching and you feel pretty good about yourself, yeah. and our platoon could really march nice. Uh -huh. They can make a straight line, and uh, we would march every Friday uh, right in front of the Admiral and the Captains, and eyes right, you you turn your eyes to the right, and all you could see was your the man's nose next, next to you. Uh -huh. You're supposed to, that keeps a straight line, yeah. uh, and you, you feel pretty proud of yourself after a while. Yeah. So then I signed up for machinist school, and I, I was able to stay there another five months uh -huh. before they sent me out to the West Coast. Uh -huh. The Navy was really good to us. They, they hired twelve Pullman cars for three hundred sailors, and they took the southern route. And we, we saw a lot of good scenery, and uh, in uh, Colorado we went through the Royal Gorge, and oh, yeah? I could lay in my bunk and look up, and s you couldn't see the top of the gorge. That's beautiful. Yeah, so that was a nice trip. Yeah. We got to San Diego, and they brought us out to the ship. To, everybody got it, the one they were assigned to. So, then I was on the Mississippi for three years. Uh huh. Now, from from boot camp and, and your training, your five months of training, do you remember any of your instructors? Mr. Cease. Cease. S e e s e. Uh -huh. I remember Chief. Chief. What we was had, he like? Well, he'd like his bottle. Once in a while, he'd go out ashore and and get too many, but yeah. he was good natured. Yeah. When he did uh, get half plastered. So he never got mean. There was another platoon there. They had a mean chief. 
and uh, if they were talking or something after sleeping hours, nine o'clock, he'd make them all get up, lash their sea bags and their bunk, and, and hold it on their back, on their on their shoulders, huh. for an hour. That's terrible. And they, one of one of the guys, he passed out. He said, "Let him lay there." I don't remember his name, but it wasn't my chief. <laughs> I was so thankful that I had a good one. That's good. Yeah, those chiefs had the power of a, a captain, you might say. Yeah. Yeah. And how, how did you get through your training and your boot camp experiences? Oh, I did it good. I, yeah. I enjoyed it after a while. Uh -huh. They took us, everybody had to learn to swim, of course, because I was a good swimmer anyway. On the outside, I could swim a mile right with nothing. So I had no trouble passing the swim test, uh -huh. which proved to be a <laughs> my fortune when when the Helena got sunk. <laughs> that saved my life. Yeah. Uh, so where am I? <laughs> so you served during World War II. Can you tell me where exactly you went? World War Two. Yeah, so oh, you actually you joined up before World War Two. So oh yeah. You went from training out to California, onto the Mississippi. Mississippi for uh -huh. three years. Yeah. Yeah. What was that like on the Mississippi? That was good duty. Yeah. Uh, we uh, made two trips out to Hawaii and on maneuvers. Uh -huh. And. I saw extinct volcanoes, uh -huh. and also I told you they we saw steam coming out of the ground. Yeah, yeah. yeah and you could cook an egg on it in, in a couple of minutes. It was so hot. Yeah. And I, after the Mississippi, I figured I'd go out and try my luck again, but it was just as hard in 1939. Uh -huh. And that's where I got a job in New London. <clears throat> And uh, uh, the job was to, we were building a, a big press for uh, Life magazine. A printing press? A printing press. And I, was, I had a 20 inch lathe with, had a bit about eight feet long. And I was making, grinding, or uh, machining some of the rolls. And that's when that tool dug in and uh, threw a chip into my eye. Yeah, much And anyway, he was getting slack, so I, I quit and I, I signed over. That's when he re-enlisted. Yeah. And he joined up with the, the Helena. Well, I first went to six weeks of uh, diesel school diesel in New school. London. Uh huh. <clears throat> and then, they sent me to Brooklyn Navy Yard on the Helena. Went in commission on September. 18th, I think it was, 19, 1939. Uh -huh. uh, in fact, I can call myself a plank owner. Oh, yeah. Anybody that puts a ship in commission and also out of commission is called a plank owner. <laughs> yeah, that's yeah. a nickname they give you. Yeah. Oh. So. Once you boarded your new ship, the, the Helena, where did you go? Well, we we had uh, test runs right off in New York, uh -huh. and uh, we opened it wide open. It was winter time, yeah. And uh, we had some rough sea out there. Uh, one night, one ensign had the bridge, and right. yeah, we were making cruises. Testing the ship, uh -huh. and uh, one night about midnight, this ensign decided this uh, this night about midnight, the ensign decided to give a, the ship a hard right rudder. Uh -huh. Now we were traveling almost top speed, 25, 30 knots, and that ship rolled over almost on the side. I was in my bunk and I was holding on for dear life. <laughs> And then the captain rolled out of his bunk up up on the bridge. Really? <laughs> he rolled out of his bunk, so he got up. 
They went up on a bridge and they, he say he cursed that ensign from A to Z. He, he was a Captain DeMott. He was a, a merchant marine captain anyway. He was tough. Yeah. And that poor ensign, I wish, I bet he wished he could crawl in the hole <laughs> after that captain started calling him everything. Because yeah. uh, the ship was top heavy. Uh -huh. uh, because after we got back back into port, into Brooklyn, they brought 600 tons of lead and put it in the bottom, the bottom of the Helena, yeah, because yeah. it was so top heavy. And then it rode pretty good. That helped out a lot? Oh, yeah. Uh huh. Yeah. So, once you left Brooklyn on the Helena, where did, where did you go? Well, after that, we went down to South, Amer South America uh -huh. and visited uh, three or four countries on a shakedown cruise uh -huh. and a goodwill tour. We, uh, we stopped at uh, Argentina first and then we went up huh. there we go. Uh, after Argentina we went we went to Brazil and And now, then we uh, went to Uruguay, because that's where the the battleship, the German pocket battleship, Graf Spee, had uh, uh, been chased in by three British cruisers. Uh -huh. Now she she crawled, came back in there because she was pretty well shot up, and the British cruisers were also, but they were able to still able to fight. So they, they bottled her in there. Now, of course, I, I went ashore. And all them Span a restaurant down there, they spoke Spanish mostly. And there was also a lot of German waitresses. I, I speak German real good. How do you know German from, uh, are you, are you? I was confirmed in German. Oh, okay. In my church. Uh-huh. Yeah, I was baptized German. <laughs> uh, well, anyway, I could order in German, and in Spanish, all I could say is dos cerveza. That means two beers. <laughs> <laughs> so I, I learned how to order two beers. Yeah. yeah. And the meals I used to order in German. <laughs> My friend, uh, John Cohn, he wanted to, show off a little bit, so he ordered his meal in, in Spanish. Uh, and the waitress laughed like hell. <laughs> Said he just ordered horse meat. <laughs> yeah. Well, anyway, after the Graf Spee finally decided to uh, leave, because Uruguay didn't want him there no more. They, they went out about five or six miles and blew it up the ship. They blew it up. Uh, all hands abandoned it. The captain blew his brains out yeah. before he he didn't dare go back to tell Hitler he lost the ship. Yeah. <laughs> they would have shot him right away anyway. So we have a picture of his uh, funeral there. Yeah. So we came back to New York and decided to go to the West Coast. Let's see, I forgot about the date we got to the West Coast, but anyway. And he sailed through the Panama Canal? Went through Panama Canal, yeah. Uh -huh. Through the locks. I, I, I've been through the canal three times. Uh -huh. Yeah. Uh, in fact, when I, I forgot to say, the Mississippi in 1939, we came through the canal and one of the engines got stuck into mud. Going through the canal? Uh, yeah, uh, the G Gaylord Cutter, one of them, Gail where they had to dig it with sh sh uh, steam shovels, yeah. Uh -huh. Well, anyway, the mud got pretty deep and the, the uh, Mississippi is very, 
very it draws a lot of water, about thirty some feet. Yeah. So one of the engines was got sucked mud, was sucking in mud. So we had to shut it down right away and close the main injection valve. Uh -huh. And then we backed down and uh, turned the high pressure steam and that, that blew the mud out. Flushed it out. Flushed out the mud so we could bring the engine back on. Uh -huh. So we got through the canal that way. Uh -huh. We were going the Mississippi was going to the World's Fair in New York at that time. Oh, yeah? In 1939, it was a World's Fair. No kidding. Yeah. Well, so they, they docked, up, docked up by the World's Fair there? Yeah, they docked off outside uh -huh. in the harbor. Uh -huh. uh, in fact, my, my girlfriend came with my brother and his wife to meet me at the World's Fair uh, while I was in Brooklyn. Uh -huh. He, uh, So everything was going rosy until we got out, got to Pearl Harbor, and uh, uh -huh. after about eight, about a year of gunnery practice, uh, we, of course, Pearl Harbor came along, December 7th. Yeah. Yeah. I had uh, the auxiliary watch, you call that. Uh -huh. The four to eight that night on December sixth, uh -huh. and I came off a watch at a quarter to eight, and I told the mess attendant to just go ahead and clean up. No, I didn't want to eat no breakfast. I had a couple of sandwiches in the engine room, yeah. uh, and then I was going to go ashore and get a milkshake at the Y and good hot, a good hamburg. Yeah. So I got into the shower and started soaping down real good. And just about then, the officer of the deck came on a loudspeaker and he shouted, all hands, man your battle stations. Japanese planes are attacking Ford Island. Hmm. And then about a few seconds later, the torpedo hit right underneath us. On the Helena? On the Helena, yeah. Well, then the fire came up through all the passageways. And I was lucky to be in the shower soaking wet. And that's what saved my life. All I, I felt was a hot blast go by me uh -huh. and out the porthole. But there was another guy, I have his name written down here. He got burnt so bad, he was right in line with the washroom door. Uh -huh. And the fire came in. He was scrubbing clothes in the bucket. You know, when you only had underwear like that, you'd, you'd wash him up in the bucket. Yeah. You wouldn't bother sending him to the laundry. Well, anyway, he was washing in a bucket. And of course, all you have on is a pair of shorts. But the rest of his body was bare. The fire hit him in the back so bad he burned so bad, within three hours, he was dead. Yeah. And that, that was only six feet away from me. So I, I considered I was lucky to be in the shower soaking wet. Yeah. That saved my life, you know. Yeah. So what <sighs> happened after, so after you got out of the shower, uh, how did you get out of there, out of the ship? Oh, we didn't have to get out. Oh. We closed all the watertight doors as quick as possible. Uh -huh and kept the ship afloat. Uh -huh. Yeah, it only went down a little at the bow mm -hmm. because they had all the other watertight doors and if the water did come in, it only seeped in a little at a time. Yeah. Uh, after two days, they put us into dry dock, which was right right close to us. Uh -huh. The tugs, they pushed us in the dry dock and they took out the, the smashed machinery that, the turbines, the, the fire room got blasted. All hands in the fire room got killed, and uh -huh. anybody that was in the engine room drinking coffee got killed. Yeah. Uh, How many casualties? Well, that? 33 in, in Pearl Harbor. Uh -huh. 33 died. Uh -huh. Some got up, shot up on deck by planes that were strafing. 
And anyway, we uh, we got uh, we got the two diesel engines that saved the Helena pretty well. One up forward, one in aisle. Ah, big, big diesel jobs. Uh, they put out enough generating juice to supply the whole ship. Those were okay, so we started them, and then with three or four minutes, our guns were shooting, yeah. shooting at the Japs with aircraft. Uh -huh. And of course, our boilers were making black smoke. We were trying to light off with cold oil, yeah. and uh, oil don't burn good unless it's 140 or more. So anyway, they got steam up on one boiler. And that kept the Japs away pretty well because we were making so much smoke we filled the harbor <laughs> with that smoke and that protected a lot of the ships from being bombed. Yeah. They, yeah. What was going through your mind uh, when, when all this was happening? Well, you didn't have much time to think. Right. You pitied the poor guys that were walking around with skin hanging off their hands and legs, yeah. burnt skin, and they were whimpering, yeah. crying, howling for a, a hospital corpsman, you know, to take care of them, uh -huh. give them a shot of morphine. Uh -huh. Some of the guys were laying on deck already dead, and you couldn't do much for them except pity them. Before your ship was moved to, to dry dock after a couple of days, what did you do in those couple of days when you were sitting there? We well, were just cleaning up and eating sandwiches for three days. Uh, our gallery was dirty, and so they had to clean the gallery good before they could cook. Uh -huh. So we ate sandwiches for three days, and finally they got us into, into dry dock, and we got steam from the the shore there. We were right alongside the dock, uh -huh. number 1010 dock. Uh, so they worked on it for about 20 days. and I never see yard workmen go so fast, <laughs> or work so fast. Yeah. Usually they're dogging it, you know. Yeah. But after that, torpedo in, and they were active, boy. We'd have drills a little bit afterward, and they would run like crazy, get topside out of the where they were working. Uh -huh. Well, any they were they, in 20 days. They they put a, a false bottom on the ship, uh -huh. and they took off two of the main screws so that we could travel faster. Yeah. We came back to the states on two screws, and okay. the other two we had up on deck. On the Helena. On the Helena, yeah. Now, when you, when you got off the ship, uh, when you were in dry dock, what did you think of Pearl Harbor? How did it look after? I mean, what, you, what was going through your mind when you, when you, when you saw the devastation of what the Japanese did? Well, <laughs> you can't think much, but uh, the officers that should have been sending peop planes out on patrol, uh -huh. even our radar system wasn't too good, but uh, uh, one of the seamen picked up, he says, a, a whole bunch of dots in the distance about an hour away. He reported it to the lieutenant, and he says, oh, forget it. Huh. And uh, they reported it to the head man or head, head the head admiral, and they disregarded it. So they had plenty of warning. They should have had some planes out patrolling. They had these PBYs that go, could go a couple thousand miles uh -huh. and land on the water, too. So we were caught with our pants down. Yeah. Uh, so they patched up the Helena, and we were headed back to the States. We came, what happened, uh, what was the ride bike back on the Helena after Pearl Harbor? The, uh, well, we were glad to go back to the States. We knew we were going to get some time off, uh -huh. leave. Um, and we were in, in the Navy Yard, uh, Mayor Island Navy Yard, for a good six months. Uh -huh. And meanwhile, they put on more 
40 millimeter guns uh, and we put on the best radar that was out uh -huh. which saved other ships and which let us sink many other ships, <laughs> Japs. We had the best radar in the whole system. Okay. Further on, we used to go out and when we took on the enemy, we could pick them up at six, 7,000 yards. The other ships didn't have nothing on their radar. That's pretty good for, for back then. Oh, yeah. That's great. And we'd, we'd, we requested permission once at 6,000 yards to open up. The Admiral laughed at us. He was on a different ship. What are you going to shoot at, he says. <laughs> so we closed into 4,000. We asked again. Now we don't see nothing on our radar. Yeah. We finally closed in a little over 2,000 yards. and We told him we had definite targets. He says, OK, if you want, shoot. Our first 19 guns sunk a cruiser. Huh. Yeah, set it on fire and she sunk in, in hardly no time. Okay. Yeah. That was uh, our first battle. Yeah. That's all listed there on that list. Uh -huh. <laughs> Bill, are you falling asleep? Nope. <laughs> I so, bet you getting sick of this story. <laughs> so when you get when they get back into the United States, uh, you have a little time off, you said? Were you able to go back to Connecticut? No. We went through all these battles. The battle for Guadalcanal was the worst. Uh -huh. And we got raid. Uh, they had talked us with a bunch of planes the afternoon before the big battle. Uh, so the the Admiral decided to make a, a big circle like the pioneers used to make when they made our wagons. Yeah. So we did the same thing with our ships and they came in with I think 20 some beddies, two motor jobs, but they came in slow. Yeah. Oh, they, got, they got shot down like nothing. Yeah. <laughs> and our planes were shooting them down too. Uh -huh. I think only one or two got away out of 28. That's good. Yeah. That's good. Well, anyway, that night was the big battle. We uh, we knew they were coming down with plenty of two battleships, cruisers, destroyers. Uh -huh. And they had about 20. All this information was given to us by the watchers. Uh, they had their name. They were from New Zealand and, uh -huh. and uh, Australia. I got pictures of them. They, they would hide way up high, and they could see any Jap movement came out of truck. Truck was the main place where the Japs' fleet was. It was about 500 miles north of us. Well, anyway, they would report, so we knew exactly what to expect. And uh, that night, they came in with battleships. They were going to bombard the, job, the Marines on Guadalcanal. They had, a, of course, they had Henderson Field already in operation. We took that away from them. They, yeah. It was half finished when we took it away from the Japs. Uh -huh. So, um, anyway, they were going to bombard, so they didn't, they didn't have regular fighting ammunition. They had bombardment shells uh -huh. in the battleships. That's shells that's loaded with all kinds of scrap metal, you know. That's for killing personnel only. Yeah. Well, the, ba the cruiser, San Francisco, eight, eight inch cruiser, she, she tackled one of them battleships. And she was shot up so bad, but she didn't get any, any damage underneath. Uh, so it stayed afloat? Still afraid afloat. Every officer on that ship was dead except one. Huh. The uh, only one, the uh, navigator, was still alive. Hmm. But uh, Admiral Scott and Admiral Callahan got killed. Two admirals. Uh, we had our our. Uh, 
our, nobody could dare use a searchlight, but our, our radar system helped identify the Jap ships. Oh, so. And um, we got some damage up on top, small fire, superstructure, but no, we didn't get hit with a torpedo underneath. So we come out of that battle in still fighting condition. Out of 13 ships against 20, we had four left. Mm -hmm. Some beached themselves. Uh, of course, the Juno took a torpedo that, that night. And um, we, uh, we took one shell hit right on a turret, number five turret. Uh, it was a good sized shell. It didn't, it didn't not go through. The turret has about five inches of steel on the front. But it did, it did uh, mess up the, the machine part of the gun. Uh -huh. So the next time they fired, it stuck. The, it wouldn't come back out. See? So we had to go down to uh, Sydney, Australia and get that turret pushed out. Uh -huh. We were pulling into Sydney and uh, there was a bunch of people on the dock. And our sailors, of course, were up on deck. And the people on shore asked, what happened to your ship? Termites, they said. <laughs> <laughs> the guys, the sailors, termites. <laughs> it's a big joke. <laughs> you know, sailors got to have their joke. Yeah. So they treated us well in, in Sydney. Uh -huh. Were you able to get off ship? Oh, yeah. I got. Yeah. Every other night. <laughs> what was it like? Did you do anything fun when you were in Sydney? Well, I got drunk a couple of times. That's always fun. We all got drunk. In fact, whiskey was cheap. Yeah. But milk was scarce. Uh huh. I know. No, no ginger ale. That's right. They, they had no ginger ale. But whiskey was only three dollars a quart. A government store too. Uh huh. So we'd all go down and grab a bottle. And Walk the streets drinking. Have a good time. Uh, of course, we'd get a room in a hotel, and yeah. if there was any women around, they'd gladly walk, walk in with you. Oh yeah. Oh yeah, women. Sydney women were friendly. Women were sailor. very friendly. <laughs> That's good. Yeah, because <laughs> all their men were in West Africa or in Africa yeah. fighting. There was not many uh, uh, Australian soldiers in in. Only those that were fighting in New Guinea, yeah. trying to keep them from the Japs from taking the Port Moresby in that that island. Uh -huh. So it was a good stay. Yeah. Twenty twenty days in Australia. We hated to leave. <laughs> On our way back, we got the bad news: okay. your ship is expendable. We thought we were going back to States. When they said your ship is expendable, were, we didn't have many ships left out there. So that, that lowered our spirits about 90%. <laughs> so where did you go? And we went back into our old, near Guadalcanal. Uh -huh. And then we bombarded other islands. They were, we were landing Marines on different islands and we would uh, bombard the coast so the Marines could move in. Uh -huh. We did that quite a few times. And then we went into Kula Gulf three nights in a row. It was moonlight. And the third, not third night, they were laying for us. Uh, ten destroyers. Uh -huh. and we had two, three cruisers and a couple destroyers. Yeah. Well, anyway, our our fault was we had used up all our no no flame ammunition okay and uh, all we had left was flame and that put out a lot of flame when you fire you know which is is that not good for nighttime or? it showed you up at night uh -huh. you know you lit up like a christmas tree when you fired them guns because yeah. all that fire came out and it stayed there a while we uh, we we fired I think seven minutes 
we knocked off two destroyers and we were working on a third one. The third one got through and launched three torpedoes and that's what sunk us. Oh. Yeah. So you sunk out in the Guadalcanal? In Kula Gulf. In Kula Gulf? Kula Gulf, yeah. It was 18 months after Guadalcanal. Do you remember what date that was when you sunk? Yeah, July 6, 1943. Uh-huh. Were there any casualties on the ship when it sunk? Oh, yeah. Yeah. And of course, those that were in a turret, a turret was way down, that's what they handled all the ammunition for the guns up above. Yeah. So they, they lose about 80 men. Uh -huh. I think we lost 168 men. Yeah. Some, some drowned and some, some were down in and couldn't get out. But I was just lucky. Or we were lucky to get. Where were you on your vacation? I was in the after engine room. Uh -huh. I was chief of the watch, and the chief engineer wouldn't let us out of there until he checked every JV phone. And when he couldn't get the captain, then he says, "Okay, open the hatch." So, of course, in my hurry, I forgot my life jacket it was at the bottom of the hatch. We no sooner cleared the the engine room and closed the hatch and the third our torpedo hit under us. Yeah. And that's when the the air pressure was pushing us back and then the water hit the door. Uh -huh. So I ran into, well everybody ran into the next compartment and got on that ladder. It seemed like everybody got there ahead of me. I, when that water hit the door, it just washed me from one side of the ship to the other. Uh -huh. I was already deep. So I did get on a ladder, as I told you before. There was one man ahead of me, <laughs> standing on the ladder. Yeah. He was kind of slow getting that door back open. I was trying to help him. He finally got it open and, and pushed it up so he could get through. He got about halfway through, and I decided to help him. So I gave him the shoulder. <laughs> <laughs> and when I did, I just knocked him clean through that hole. <laughs> And the next day, of course, he, on, on shore, he told me, some son of a bitch hit me in the ass and knocked me clean through that scuttle hole. Yeah. I sheepishly admit it was me. <laughs> we had a good laugh. Yeah. It was a junior vid division of us. Yeah, and we both were happy to be alive. That was the end of the Helena. And what, what happened? So the Helena was sinking. What did, what did you do when he got off clock? I was up on top, and I just laid on deck and watched the battle when it was still firing. I didn't seem to, after getting out of the engine room, I figured I, I got it made. Yeah. But then they, we could see the, the ship was starting to break in the middle. And a couple of seamen said, we better get them wraps off the top of the turret. So they cut them off and threw two wraps over the side. Uh -huh. and. Uh, I didn't have a life jacket, so a friend of mine, he said, oh, I want to hold hands and go over together, Klutz. Yeah. So we did, we held hands, went over together, and then uh, got on the raft. But then the powder cases, the powder cases, when after you fire them, they, they fall out on deck. And the ship was tipping to starboard. And they powder cases were landing on our head on the raft. So yeah. I swam away from the raft a little bit. And then I was watching the ship go down so slowly. My home for four years. And I don't know, I, I just couldn't take my eyes off of it until it finally went below. Yeah. Then I, I thought, I better get on a raft here. <laughs> so I'm looking around for a raft. They've all floated away on me while I was so enthused <laughs> watching that ship go down. So then I started to dog paddle and I also started to pray. <laughs> I prayed hard. <laughs> In fact, I begged the Lord to save my life. I must have dog paddled a, close to an hour before in the dark I heard voices and I swam and got onto another set of rafts. Yeah. Were they, they, they were from your ship, the raft you got on? Oh yeah. Did you know them? Oh, well, yeah, I did. Uh -huh. 
Yeah, there was two ship, two destroyers stayed behind the Radford and the Nicholas. Uh -huh. I got picked up by the Nicholas. Uh -huh. um, yeah, so. But what was it like when he got on board? You said the the, the Nicholas. Yeah. Okay. Well, they were still shooting. They were still shooting at a cruiser or something, yeah. and and launching torpedoes. I was outside the the handling room where they handled all the ammunition. And one of the guys, here's a cigarette <laughs> and a cup of coffee. I said, boy, they allow you to do that during a battle? <laughs> so they're very easy going on, on a destroyer. Yeah. Here I am soaking wet and covered with oil. He gets me a cigarette and uh, a cup of coffee. Right. I went up on deck and then they were still shooting. And the shells were dropping out there too, so I, I went down below. <laughs> and of course, then they took us into Tulagi, one of the, the little yeah. islands north of uh, Guadalcanal. Uh -huh. And we got on to the Helena, I mean, and the cruiser, uh -huh. St. Louis and Honolulu. They were sister ships. And they brought us back to Numea, New Caledonia, I mean, uh, Espirito Santo. Uh -huh. Uh, of course. Did he give you a fresh set of clothes when he got on the Nicholas? Or? Oh, oh, not on there, but on the Honolulu, uh -huh. the cruiser. Yeah, so I, you were able to change. Oh yeah, the guys they open up their lockers and give us shoes. Yeah. I kicked my shoes off when I was in the water. I, yeah. I figured I could swim better, <laughs> so I didn't have any shoes. Uh, yeah, they were good. Uh -huh. Then we get in, got into the land in Espirito Santo and. They give us small stores. They call it small stores, so we could go and get what we needed. I think they allowed us a hundred some dollars yeah. for new clothes. Huh? Is that thing on? <laughs> it is. It is. Um, we'll move on here. Um, can you tell me, uh, were any uh, fellow sailors or anybody that you knew uh, captured for prisoner of war when it went the Helena sunk? No, uh, none of them. They were, that's good. Some of them floated onto an island, two different islands, and uh, there was a hundred and sixty some, and the, the natives protected them and hid them in the jungle. And if anybody, any Jap got close, they'd bring back their head. Yeah. <laughs> Yeah, and them natives, they had bolos, a long bolo knife, and one whack and off goes the head. <laughs> yeah, they protected our men while they hid in the jungle until the Americans got some more old destroyers and went in there one night and picked them up. Uh -huh. That's all in, the, all in the story. Now, could you tell me uh, about a couple of your most memorable experiences? <sighs> Hmm. Experience. Yeah. Well, I think it was. I think it was off in New York when I was really worried about going over. This is on the Helena? Yeah. We were trying out the ship, as I told you. And when the guy rolled the captain out of his bunk for making that quick turn. Yeah. And going at full speed, um, I thought the ship was going over. It was hanging them, and I was shaking, <laughs> holding on to my bunk. That's one of them I thought I was a goner. Yeah. Uh, well, the next next one I guess was Pearl Harbor itself. So, taking a shower, and I got out of the shower after the, the smoke cleared. I found a pair of shoes in the dark and, and a pair of shorts. That's all I had on during the whole battle. Because you were coming from the shower. Oh yeah. yeah. I couldn't find no towel or nothing. And then I went up one deck where it was some air to breathe. Because I it was so smoky down below, I had to go up one more deck. Yeah. And I stayed up there about a minute until the smoke cleared. And I looked out on the harbor and what a mess, I'm telling you today. 
Arizona was burning. More than one ship was burning. Sailors were jumping off, swimming underwater to get away from the burning oil and getting on another rescue, whatever it was. The Oklahoma had quite a few men trapped and couldn't get out. And they were hammering on the, the side of the ship. So they, they, and the welders went to work and cut big holes and tried to, they got quite a few of them all wow. out. Yeah. Yeah, Pearl Harbor. Of course, the other was the night we got sunk. That's, <laughs> I wake up mostly every morning and still got that in my mind. Yeah. Trying to swim. Yeah. It's a good thing you were a good swimmer. That's where you. Oh yeah. Your training and. I did a lot of swimming, on the outside. Yeah. We used to swim over to an island. One time we swam. It was about a mile. We, in Bristol, terrible. Uh huh. We had just eaten some green apples. We stole them in the orchard close by. My friend and I, we ate some green apples. He said, "Let's swim over to the island, which was about a mile away." And I, th I was sure I was going to get a, <laughs> a cramp in my belly, you know, but I didn't. Uh -huh. Yeah. Now, were you awarded any medals or citations? Only the, uh, well, the medals, there it goes. They, everybody that was on the ship yeah. got them. Uh -huh. um, American Pacific and I don't know the names of them. Yeah. That little blob, white and blue ribbon up there. Uh -huh. That's the uh, Navy Unit Commendation Ribbon. Uh -huh. uh, they didn't give no other, just put that little ribbon. Yeah. And it was pinned on me by the captain of the Detroit. There's uh -huh. a picture of me in the book there. Now, moving on to a couple more sections here, and then we'll, we'll wrap it up. Uh, how did you stay in touch with your family? You couldn't. You couldn't tell them very much. Yeah. You know, everything going well, everything good. Yeah. Send your love and all that, but it was all... Uh, every letter, you had to go to officers. Uh, what's the word? <laughs> well, anyway, they, had a, they checked everything. You couldn't send out any information. Uh -huh. Yeah, so that's why I say I got love letters. Yeah. I got a whole pack of them in there really? that my wife kept. But they all meant the same thing or said the same thing. Yeah. Did they? Did your family know you were in Pearl Harbor? When oh yeah. yeah. But I sent a telegram. But then I sent out a letter, and the letter got home before the telegram. Huh. Yeah. I think it was quite a few days before they got the telegram or the AM airmail letter. And he told them you were okay? You know? Oh, yeah. yeah. Well, I didn't mean to interrupt. What were you saying? Yeah. I was going to get get leave after that. I told him I was going to get leave after yeah. after we got back to States. Uh-huh. Which I did, and we got married. <laughs> yeah. I give my wife one week to get ready, <laughs> and her mother too yeah. was rationing. It was hard to get meat and hard to get beer and whiskey and all that. Yeah. But they did. Yeah. They knew the butcher in town, and she she made quite a good wedding. Her her mother. Yeah. And you guys got married. Yeah. I got married in church and had a, hired a hall on the outside of town of Bristol. Uh -huh. And my father danced the polka. <laughs> yeah, he was in his glory. Yeah. yeah. Now in the Navy, what was the food like? The food? Yeah. There no complaints. Yeah. You got used to it. Uh-huh. They had funny names for it. I wouldn't want to depend. I wouldn't want to tell you over <laughs> Have it recorded. But yeah. <laughs> yeah. Did you have plenty of supplies? Uh, a period of three weeks, no no ship was getting through. Everything was going to Europe. 
England and Russia. Uh -huh. So no supply ships were getting out to the Pacific. And we ate beans for three weeks. Oh. All different kinds of beans and whatever was in the cans. Yeah. Or what, whatever was in the freezer, we ate. Uh, beans was mostly. Yeah. <laughs> Did you ever feel pressure or stress at all? Pressure what? Pressure or stress. I don't know what you mean. Pressure or stress? Stress? Yeah. No. Yeah. <laughs> now, was there something you did for good luck? For good luck? Yeah. I prayed. Yeah. I learned to pray real in earnest, especially when I was swimming in the dark. The water was 88 degrees. Uh -huh. That's one good thing. But also a good shark. That's good for sharks. Did you see any sharks in there? I yeah, not even. I never thought about the sharks. I just thought about getting back yeah. on another ship. Yeah. No, I. I forgot all about sharks. Of course, we had a hundred sixty thousand gallons of oil that spilled also at the same time the ship went down. So I think a lot of the ship was in oil surrounding it. Of course, I had oil in my ears and eyes and hair. I could see, but uh, boy, when we all got back shipped, the only thing that would take it off was lava soap. Yeah. You ever use lava soap? It's a gray and has pumice in it. Yeah, yeah, yeah. That's the only thing would uh, wash clean. You had to scrub down with that, huh? Yeah. But a month after I was in San Diego on uh, repair duty there, I had a infection in my right ear. So I went down to the sick bay and you start washing it out with warm water. Put a, a pan under it and catch. And finally I heard a clink, clunk. I said, what was that? And he said, oh, that's just hard oil. In your ear? I had hard oil in that ear for over a month and, and finally it got infected. So. After that, I was okay. Yeah. Yeah, I had a little oil from school ago. Ah, buy him. And um, how did people entertain themselves? On board ship? Yeah. We did have a band. We were lucky. Yeah. And uh, we had two two black men aboard ship. Were they good? One of them, he loved to dance and show off. <laughs> uh, when that band started playing, boy. When he smiled, his mouth <laughs> showed them big teeth, you know, and everybody else started laughing. Yeah, it was a card. The San Francisco was shoot shot up the morning after the battle. We sent our band over to the uh, San Francisco to cheer them up, because yeah. they had lost so many of their officers, just about every one except one. Yeah. And they were so happy. They gave us a nice lighter, a letter right up yeah. Yeah. There's a lot to read in that book. Mm -hmm. Yeah. What did you do when you're on leave? Go to <laughs> go to my wife. Yeah. I got married. Yeah. Because I couldn't stay home too long. I had to get back, so I took her back with me to San um, San Diego, and then I I was able to get a room with another uh, lady right south of San Diego in the, uh, was this? <laughs> I just gave you the name of the, it was uh, about a couple of miles south of San Diego. Close to uh, Mexico, right? A city, uh, yeah. I'm starting to forget names. <laughs> That's okay. Um, well, anyway. She, uh, her husband was on the carrier out to sea, and, and she wanted somebody in the house. So she rented the room to me and my wife for 10 bucks, 10 bucks a week. That's good. Real cheap. Yeah. Just to have somebody. And she had a small kid. And yeah, she was good to us. That's good. Norma, Norma Hansen. Norma Hansen? 
Yeah, her name was Hanson. Yeah. Uh, now, do you recall any p particularly humorous or any un unusual events at all? Hmm. Um, on our sick down close to Buenos Aires, the, um, they used to have what they called an osada, O-S-A-D-A, -A, osada, osada. Well, one of our big meat packing companies in Chicago would put it on, and the natives would uh, draw, drive sticks in the ground, make a big circle about the size of this room, and they'd take a sheep and cut them in half, or a goat, and uh, then um, light fires in the middle and, and cook that stuff. Now, I ate some of it, but when we got back to the ship, one of the guys said, well, them round things, they to tasted real good. Yeah. <laughs> he didn't know what they were. Well, the, the guy says, them are mountain oysters. <laughs> mountain oysters. <laughs> and then they explained to me they were sheep's nuts. <laughs> <laughs> what, did he, what, what was his reaction? <laughs> Well, he didn't throw them up. <laughs> yeah, uh, I see. That's one of the happiest moments huh, of good laughs. Were there ever any pranks that you would pull or others would pull uh, on you? No. No. Well, the only thing was the shellback initiation. You, know, you maybe heard about them. Yeah. Well, I've you, heard about different shellbacks. Well, yeah. Years ago, they were really sadistic. Yeah. You walk through that, that line with 20 guys hitting you on the back with, or on the ass, <laughs> and boy, you're black and black and blue for three months. Yeah. Um, and then they'd, they'd make you crawl through the, a, a tunnel line. They made canvas suits just big enough to crawl through, and they'd save garbage for three, four days and put it in that crawl in that in? in that tunnel yeah. and you them? you had to crawl through that garbage and guts and all that stuff and meanwhile you better not put your ass up or your head up there or on top waiting to hit you oh that mean that was mean they made the captain eat and buy a back box of cigars and they, he got away cheap <laughs> yeah. but any other officers they they sent him through they even put them to officers. Yeah. Oh yeah. Kim Nep King Neptune. They used to take over the ship. Ah. <sighs> what did you think of uh, your uh, of officers in that? Ah, well, most of them were good. What about the fellow sailors? Yeah, most of them were okay. Good. Did you ever keep a personal diary at all? No, not when I ship. I didn't start writing this uh, book of mine until I was in my 80, okay. 86 or so. I started to write my memories. Uh huh. Um, well, on to a little bit more here, and we'll be all set. Do you recall the day your service ended? Yeah, I had a, I had to go to New York. Uh huh. The Naval Center there when, when they. Gave me my papers and uh -huh. oh, you did want to see my discharge? Yeah, it's after, yeah. 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 Uh -huh. And what did you what did you do in the days and the weeks afterward? Well, I wanted to go to work, so I I got a job uh -huh. in a machine shop. Where? In Terryville. Uh huh. A guy named Lassie. I knew him before I joined the war before I joined the Navy. Uh -huh. And um, I was supposed to get dye, dye making trade. Mm -hmm. I, I was a good machinist anyway to start with. I, I had a, the machine shop on the hill and I was in charge. And I made a lot of stuff for the ship for the breakdown, air compressor that broke down and yeah. had put out 3,000 pound pressure. I, I had to make a new cylinder for it. Really? Any machine at all? So it was a long, only inch and a quarter would put out 3,000 pound pressure. Huh. And that's what they used to 
use this air to blow out the sparks in the guns. Uh -huh. After they fired, they, they, they hit it with air, make the sure there's no sparks left in the barrel. Yeah. Uh, well, anyway, I, I, I did some nice jobs. I fixed pumps for them. Uh -huh. I would start out with a big chunk of steel and have to hack it down into small. Yeah. Make, make a pump for, part for a pump. Yeah. Well, anyway, I, that's where I lost my finger. Oh, yeah? He, instead of diatrate, he put me on a press. I had to stand up to kick the press. It was such a hard kick. Uh, one of the little gears got stuck in there, and I reached in to try to clear it. Uh -huh. Then I stepped on the pedal at the same time, yeah. and that's when I got, got caught. Uh -huh. I had to shut the machine off and then turn the wheel backwards in order to get my finger off. <laughs> you know, it didn't start hurting until I was on the way to the hospital. Yeah. Was it pretty well mangled? Oh, yeah. I had to clean it off. Yeah. Now, did you make any close friendships when you were in the service? Yeah. yeah. I got a few pictures here. Uh-huh. And did you ever continue any of those? No. Uh -huh. Only, only the the, the the kid that did, we held hands and jumped overboard. Well, I decided after about 20 years at home, I'd like to thank him real good. Yeah. So I, in the Air Navy magazine, I advertised in his name. A friend of his in North Carolina gave me his name and address, and he was working in a print shop. I think it was in Chicago. Anyway, I, I called him up and talked to him. Yeah. I sent him a letter of thanks. Yeah. Of course, we parted the hands anyway as soon as we hit the water. <laughs> yeah. But that's the only gun Now, uh, did you ever join any veterans organizations? Yeah, we uh, we formed a, a Pearl Harbor attack veterans up in Chicopee, Massachusetts. Oh, yeah? Yeah, there was about 130 of us. I think I have a picture uh -huh. of the 130 to start with from all over New England. And uh, they uh, start dwindling, going down. We'd have a, a good, uh, nice feed once a year. Uh, we usually went to the Yankee Peddler up in Chicopee, Mass. Uh -huh. And uh, of course, they got down to six or seven members. And, they had a, a, thousand, a little over a thousand dollars in the treasury and they had to decide what to do with it because they were, had to break up. Yeah. So they decided to give the Pearl Harbor Memorial in Hawaii a thousand dollars. Yeah, I got a picture of the check. That was nice. And uh, in the memorial in uh, Pearl Harbor, they decided to honor somebody. So they said, uh, I told him to uh, take a boat and uh, give him this picture on a wall that's made with gold and uh, of the uh, Arizona when she was in tip-top condition. Uh -huh. So they, they said, whoever you think rates it. So they all voted for me. I had the most time and the biggest story to tell. Yeah. I was so glad to get that. Yeah, that's great. I'm boring the hell out of you, Bill. You've heard yeah, some of this. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Yeah. Uh, what did, so you went on, what did you do for a career after the war? You were doing machining and lathing and stuff. Well, uh, the first 10 months I worked in the machine shop till I cut my finger off. Uh -huh. And then I went electric, uh, a friend of mine, his uh, brother worked, uh, took the, had the run by my father-in-law, so his brother was a electrician in New Britain. Uh -huh. He hired me for, as an electrician apprentice. Uh -huh. And right away, uh, of course, I, I knew quite a bit about electricity anyway. So I worked there for two years, wiring houses. Uh -huh. I've wired quite a few by myself and put up the meter board and yeah. the service and all that. Yeah, I did that, and then I, uh, another friend of mine, 
he was in the Navy years ago. He, he took a liking to me and he talked, he talked to the bosses. They built a brand, a brand, brand new plant in Forestville. The Barnes Company, uh -huh. Wallace Barnes, you maybe heard of them. Yeah. And they, and the, they had a brand new boiler room. So they needed somebody to take over. So they, they finally hired me. Uh -huh. I had to show them all my papers and discharges. Yeah. And of course, a good word from him. That's what helped me get the job. That's good. And I spent 29 and a half years there. And that's where you retired from? But at the same time, they had to make the ships three twelves and one six. So I had almost a half a week off. Yeah. So I took a job at the Bristol Hospital also. My brother-in-law got me in there uh -huh. running the boilers. Yeah. So I would work two jobs for 18 years there. Okay. Yeah, of course I was building on the side. We built for a brother-in-law, built two houses of our own. My father-in-law was a old-time carpenter, uh -huh. and he was glad to get out of the shear shop. <laughs> yeah. He used to sharpen scissors, uh -huh. so he was glad to get a job, get out at his old trade. Yeah. So we built houses together. Okay. He sold a couple, made prop. I didn't make much on the one. Of course, I he helped me build my house, uh -huh. and also one below. I had five lots I bought. So you had a lot of property then. Small lots, then, Small but they lots. were big enough to build on. Yeah. Yeah, I, I, I cleared maybe $1,000 on that, but it was good experience. Yeah. And then my house, of course, cost about 18000 We, We did all our own labor, uh -huh. except the plumbing. And I sold that for about 60000 so. I made money there, and I moved to Terryville, uh -huh. to our house here. Yeah. It was kind of run down, so I got it, Fix it up. quite cheap. And I put 20000 into it, picked it all up, put a new bathroom in the back. So I, I cleared about forty, fifty thousand 50000 on that. Huh. I also bought a piece of land in Bristol. Yeah. Uh, on Birch, Birch Street, uh -huh. and um, they had four acres, four and a half acres. I got it for eighteen hundred dollars because it was right across from the pig farm. Yeah. Nobody wanted to live there, you know. Yeah. Stunk so bad. Yeah. Well, I took a chance, <laughs> and then I divided it up into four lots. I got a thousand for each, and then <coughs> it was enough. Three, three, yeah, three and a half acres left. I sold that to a plumber for sixty-five hundred. Okay. And he built a house on it. Huh. And then he had it about two years, and ESPN came along. Oh yeah, yeah. You yeah. know who he? Is, who they are? They wanted that piece of land, so they gave him a million bucks for it. Oh, you kidding me? The same piece. I got sixty-five hundred. Yeah, they tore his house down. It was only two years old. No kidding. Tore it down, leveled it off. Now that they even closed off the road, huh. they took off. They really took over the ESPN. Yeah. Yeah. So, did your military experience influence your thinking about war or about the military in general? No, I wanted to get ahead. I yeah. I wasn't getting anywhere. I had to work my way through high school, setting up pins. I set up pins in a local bowling alley. Oh, yeah? And they were from October until April. And then they'd shut down. Only in the wintertime. Yeah. And I set up pins for four cents a game. Four cents a game? Four cents a game. That's a lot of uh, re-racking, huh? Oh, that's a lot of action. <laughs> it gave me a good, strong back. I bet. <laughs> my back today is good. Good. I got a better back than most young guys. <laughs> a lot of exercise. That's good. My father wasn't making much in Eagle Lock. One week he came home with a 29 cent paycheck. <laughs> Everything was piecework. You either had work or you went home. Yeah. No day work. Yeah. Well, I'd bring home four to five dollars. 
on a Saturday night. I'd put the money on the bureau in the morning. My mother would come in and look at it, and she'd look at me. How much can I have? <laughs> yeah. I said, give me 50 cents for movies. Yeah. Take the rest. Okay. You know, you could buy groceries for four people for $5 for a week. Yeah. And that's what we lived on during the winter. The bowling money? Mostly, yeah. Once in a while, he got he got some piece work, but it was rough. My daughter, my sister in Torrington had a job, and she would send ten dollars once in a while help out. Yeah, I was depression, the big depression. Yeah. Now, did you ever attend any reunions? Reunion? Well, once a year, when we with your organization, we have that uh, feed. Uh -huh. Yeah. Up in Chicopee? Chicopee, yeah. yeah. Now, how did the service and experiences affect your life? Oh, I think it made, it gave me a life. Yeah. I had nothing. High school education and no job. Uh -huh. And pick up odds and ends here and there, but I think the uh, Navy gave him, gave me more experience than the machinists. And I also had a good record. I, I almost took a job as a postal clerk. Okay. But I, I wasn't getting even the post office. I put in an application. I passed a good test. But then I waited and waited. Other guys were getting in. They were buddies of the postmaster. Oh, so I finally ro bo ro rode into Boston and fo asked why I, I'm not getting in. I got good marks in my test. So they got a hold of the postmaster and told him to hire me. So he called me in and he offered me a job. I said, is it permanent? No, part-time, <laughs> temporary. Yeah. I said, if it's temporary, I don't want it. But like a, like a fool, I should have taken it because uh, everything is temporary when you work for the government. Yeah. They, can, they can lay off after three months they don't want you. Yeah. You work for the state? Hmm. Uh, yeah. Oh. Well, I'm a student at that at the college, so hmm. central. Now, is there anything else that you'd like to add uh, that we haven't covered in the interview? Oh, I think that pretty well covers it. Okay, well, I want to thank you um, for your time today, and I want to thank you uh, for your service. You're welcome. <laughs>